Son into the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, our Lord, the Son of Justice, you dawn from the Father before all ages, and from Mary at the appointed time. Make us worthy to celebrate this day in honor of your pure mother with spiritual hymns, and to glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Praise, glory, honor, and praise to the exalted one who humbled himself and exalted the humble virgin, to God who became man and saved humanity, to the Most High who lowered himself and raised up the lowly, to the good one be glory and honor on this day and all the days of our lives and forever. As we honor the blessed ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of God, we ask that she intercede for us with her Son, the fruit of her womb, we pray. O Lord, through the prayers of your Holy Mother, keep away from the earth and its people the devastation of wrath and all dangers, dissension, war, famine, and epidemics. Have compassion on us and heal the sick. Help the poor, save the oppressed. Grant rest to the faithful departed who have left us and have gone to you and make us worthy of a safe and peaceful death that we may raise glory to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever. lily and fragrant rose. The fragrance of your holiness has filled the entire universe. 
Pray for us that we may become the sweet fragrance of Christ that spreads throughout the world. We offer this incense for the living, that they may be strong in faith, and for the dead, that they may be granted salvation. And may we enjoy eternal happiness and praise the Most Holy Trinity forever. second letter of St. Paul to Timothy. Praise to the glory to the Lord of Paul and the apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, a descendant of David. Such is my gospel for which I am suffering, even to the point of chains like a criminal. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I bear with everything for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus, together with eternal glory. This saying is trustworthy. If we have died with him, we shall also live with him. If we persevere, we shall also reign with him. But if we deny him, he will deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Praise be to God always.
To the praise, glory, and honor of the Most Holy Trinity, we burn this incense. Here we have some. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, who proclaimed life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Remain silent, O listeners. The Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks to the word of the living God. The evangelist Luke writes, now on that very day, two of them were going to a village, a Sabbath day journey from Jerusalem called Emmaus. And they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them. But their eyes remained, were prevented from recognizing him. And he asked them, What are you discussing as you walk along? And they stopped, looking downcast. And one of them, named Cleopas, said to him in reply, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know of the things that have taken place in these days? And he replied to them, Which things? And they said to him, The things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all people, and how our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we had been hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and they did not find his body. And they came back and they reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. Then some of those with us went to the tomb and found these things just as the women had described. But him they did not see. And he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. And as they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on farther. But they said to him, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. And so he went in and he stayed with them. And as it happened, that while he was at table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and he gave it to them. And at that moment their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us, while he spoke to us on the way, and opened the scriptures to us. And so they set out at once, and they returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven, and those with them, who were saying, The Lord has truly been raised, and has appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted what had taken place on the way, 
and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the truth, peace be with you. Be mindful that the Lord Jesus Christ has risen from the dead of the seed of David according to my gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. This second letter to Timothy is written most likely during St. Paul's second imprisonment in Rome, about the year 67, the imprisonment that's going to actually finish with his martyrdom, his death. So as we mentioned, when St. Paul writes to Timothy and he writes to Titus, these are the last letters, among the last letters that he writes, and they're very practical in their conclusions. But what's fascinating to see here in this small excerpt that we have read today, and in the bulletin where you have it in italics, if we've been faithful to him, he will be faithful to us if we do not. That is most likely, the commentators and the fathers consider that this is probably an original early Christian hymn that he's quoting. So it's a quotation. That's why he says, this saying is true. Saying, you know this already, you know this, these verses. And so that's why it's in italics. What is interesting here in this quotation that we began with, when he tells Timothy, remember the gospel I preached to you. He has risen from the dead, brought us life, and he is a descendant of David. He actually winds up making then this descent, his origin in time, born of the virgin, as being equal to his resurrection. What he's of course emphasizing in the fact of being a descendant of David is that he is the Messiah who has fulfilled the prophecies, centuries of the prophetic teachings uh, in Israel. That's what he's emphasizing. But for us, of course, because this Sunday falls so well on the first Sunday of May for Our Lady of the Lebanon, that we were going to talk about the Blessed Virgin Mary, this emphasis. If you note the prayer in the beginning of today's liturgy, it speaks about the Son who from all eternity radiates from the Father, and then who, who time came forth from the Virgin, the Virgin Mary. So there is the aspect of eternity and time, there's the aspect of who this woman is and why does she hold such a central position. Indeed, she's in, in orthodoxy and in Catholicism, she is almost practically identified, freaks out the Protestants. But there's a reason why that this overlapping, because the same eternal son there's only one filiation. There's only one sonship in our Lord Jesus Christ. He's only the son of one, and that's his father. But in time, this woman is elevated and introduced in a sense so that the one eternal hidden son, that one divine generation of eternity, she enters into so that the child that is born to her is also that same one Son of God. Now, when we look at this, of course, we've talked about different things about this woman. She really stands as a center. And again, to repeat that she's just a human being. Our Lord, of course, is God and man. He is God entering into time as a man. But this woman is, of course, created from nothing like all the rest of us. She has no pre-existence before her conception in her mother's womb of St. Anne. She is special in many ways because of her spotlessness and her sinlessness, but her sinlessness is only because of her son. She is kept impeccable. She is kept without sin. 
because of the son that will be born to her, not because of any intrinsic merit to her in itself. Everything comes back, and in order to understand who Mary is, you have to understand who Jesus is. And what the church has always held about Mary is because of what it holds about Jesus. This woman, essentially, in the Annunciation, when the angel Gabriel appears to her, this young woman, again, she's probably only about 16 or 17. When the angel Gabriel manifests, comes to her on the Annunciation, she has a spousal relationship with the divine word. The child who will be born to her, she will be mother of this divine and eternal son. But her relationship with God is the consent as in matrimony, to bring forth a child in life. So she has a spousal relationship in the Annunciation. In the Incarnation at Christmas, of course, she has a maternal relation. The child who is born to her, she is mother of this child, of course. She is the mother of this God. But we also have in the Gospels, when our Lord addresses her, it's very unusual, and we've noted this last year with these different Gospels, is he calls her woman, which sounds very strange, and to our ears sounds like he's kind of rebuffing her. Because we don't understand the prophecies and we don't understand the Old Testament mentality of who this woman is, and that's what we're going to come back to. But just to remember that St. John is the one who gives us these details. The other three Gospels don't really talk about this. But in St. John, we have two episodes that are given. One is the miracle at Cana, the changing of water into wine. And it's the very beginning of his ministry. In fact, it's what initiates the three years, the changing of water into wine at this marriage. And it's instigated by his mother. They have no wine. You know the story. And then St. John, and of course St. John is writing decades after the other three Gospels. And so he wants to point out details for the consideration and for the teaching of the Christian faithful by pointing out specific miracles and giving their lessons behind them. He only covers seven miracles in his Gospel, but each of them have profound lessons behind them. The other Gospels tell us nothing about Cana, but in the Gospel of St. John, we have this episode, and we have the second episode, being called woman, is also from St. John. And that, as we've mentioned, was on Good Friday, when he sees his mother standing at the foot of the cross at the end of his ministry, three years later, the beginning and the end, being called woman. He says to her, woman, behold your son, pointing, you know, indicating John, who's also standing there. But to John, he says, behold your mother, this maternal relationship with John, because as the fathers interpret, John is us. And in the moment of his death, he commits the woman to, in St. John, sometimes it's translated as saying, took him into his own, took her into his own house. But in the Greek, the term is, he took her taidia, among his things, our word idea is the same. That he brought the Blessed Virgin Mary into his life, not just simply to give her shelter, but according to John in the Greek, taidia, among his own. She becomes part of what he is. And that's that aspect at the moment of our Lord's death, that the, our, she becomes the mother of the church represented by St. John. So we've had this spousal relationship with the divinity. We have a maternal relationship with the divinity. We have the fact of woman. And of course, at Pentecost, we're told in the Acts of the Apostles, she is there in the midst of the 120 people waiting for the power on high, the promise of the Father. So she is an essential, in a sense, as mediatrix. She is the one by whom the continuation of this work of redemption that will come to its crowning in the Pentecostal miracle of the descent of the Holy Spirit, she has an aspect of mediatrix. It's with our Lord. And then finally, of course, in her assumption, she becomes the great exemplar of what the church is meant to be in faith, in response, in fidelity, in love. And of course, in her assumption, she arrives at that definitive glory of the resurrection of the body that all of us hope for. 
It's not something that's unique to her. What's unique to her is that it's already happened. She was not allowed to rot in the grave like the rest of us will do. And again, the reason for that is because it's from that womb, from that person, from that life that the Messiah came forward. And again, the lack of not allowing her to corrupt is because of the one to whom she gave flesh. And therefore, she arrives at this fullness of glory in the assumption, in this spousal relationship, again, of the definitive day of glory. So let's come back to this idea of why he calls her woman. And besides, on the fact you can talk about Good Friday for your Protestant friends, because they go, well, you know, there's other brothers and sisters of Jesus. It says it in the gospel. He has brethren. Well, that's never affected any of the Eastern churches because everyone is cuz, right? Everyone's my cousin. So the fact that he got brothers and sisters doesn't phase any of the Mediterranean. Sure, Jesus, is, of course he's got brothers and sisters. But to the European ear, to the Germanic people reading the Gospels, like, see, there you go. Mary had other children. It doesn't say that at all. So he's got brothers and sisters, of course, and he's got lots of aunts and lots of uncles all over the place, the entire village, in fact. And so none of that really phased it until the Europeans read it and went, oh, well, look. But another detail to add to that, if there really were uterine brothers and sisters, for lack of a better term, our Lord would never have handed his mother off to St. John, who's not related to him at all. Clearly, he's the only son who is committing to the care on a human level, his mother to the care of his beloved disciple, and the only one who's there, actually. All the rest have run away. So it's one of those details to say, yes, yes, of course he has brothers and sisters. It's in the scriptures, yes. And in the Old Testament, Abraham calls Lot his brother. But in fact, we know from the scriptures of the genealogies that Abraham is Lot's uncle, we would call him. But in the scriptures, it calls him his brother. So, you know, this has never affected, like I said, the Eastern churches, but we have lots of Protestant friends. So we need to be able to go through the scriptures and explain these things. So let us return to this glory of who this woman is. And by the way, you have a picture on the front of the bulletin. Um, it's Our Lady of Lebanon, Our Lady of Harissa. And you will always see pictures of it in this kind of strange position because it's a very, very large statue on top of a column attached to a church, but it's on top of a mountain overlooking the Mediterranean Sea. So everyone taking pictures of it is always underneath it. And you walk up, there's a, a staircase that goes up to the base of the statue. We have a miniature version of it at our basilica outside of Youngstown, Ohio. Our Lady of Lebanon, which is the second collection today to keep the basilica going. So nationally, we try to keep our national basilica alive. So there's a smaller version, and I highly recommend if you haven't done it, at some point you make a pilgrimage out there. They do a humdinger of the Assumption. It lasts for three days. So hey, if you ever want to go to northern Ohio, there you go, is your chance. After all, you have the great dreams of visiting Pittsburgh, don't you? Come on. All right, so this aspect of woman, why at the beginning, and why does St. John consider it so important, the one who received this woman, Taidia, among his own, of what he is, that he felt required that decades later in the gospel to tell of two stories that were not recounted in the other gospels. So that at Cana, when he has this, when the, his mother says to him, they have no more wine, and he says to her, what is that to me and to you? It's a, a scriptural way. It's a, the Old Testament way of speaking. That's not our concern. What is that between me and you? It's not a rebuke. He's saying that's not our concern. But he also is telling her, you know what this means, which is why he calls her woman. Now that's why we have to put it into the context that Mariam, and of course, Mariam, the name, is associated with our term Mar. Mar Yosef, Mar Charbel. It's the notion of lordship, saintly, holy, uh, one who is superior to us. That's the name of Mariam. 
But when he says to her, woman, remember Genesis. In the book of Genesis, in the creation of the human race, there are two recountings of the creation of humanity. In chapter one, we are simply told that God said, let us make man, let us make Adam to our image and likeness. And then it says immediately, male and female, he made them. The reality, obviously, in that lesson is that the reality of this reflection of God is not just simply, the, it's not the individual, it's the male and female who is the image of God. Male and female, he created them. And then, of course, probably the story you, everyone knows better, is that Adam being put into a sleep, this is the second recounting, and from his side, woman is created, when Adam comes out of this prophetic sleep, it's not sleep in the sense of a dream, the same term used in Hebrew is the same kind of state that the prophets go into when they receive their messages. That's the sleep that he's put into. So when he comes out of this prophetic state, there is woman standing in front of him and he says, this is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. And therefore she shall be called Isha because she is made from Ish. So just the Hebrew terms of man and woman. And what you may not know is that in Genesis, we all know them, we call them Adam and Eve and we do all of this. But as I told you, the word Adom just means man, right? as in human being. So sometimes in Genesis it refers to this first man, male, but in general it also refers just to humanity. This is not a story about a man and a woman, it's a story about humanity who happened to be at that time just one of each. But in Genesis, the only time that the woman is called Eve, that Isha is called Eve, is after the fall. It's the very last thing done before you finish the whole story of the collapse of humanity is that she has this name now of Eva, of Eve. Otherwise, every time in Genesis that Isha is referred to, she is just called Isha. She is just woman. So that when our Lord addresses the woman who is his mother, He's also reminding her, you know what this is going to be. What is that between me and you? My hour has not yet come. She initiates this whole thing the way in Genesis, Eve is the first to partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and then brings Adam into this complicity. Here you have the new Eve initiating the new Adam into this work of redemption, which is why he says to her, why, what is that between me and to you? You know that my, my hour has not yet come. But in that, he addresses her as woman. She is the new Eve, she is Isha. Not just simply his mother, but this woman stands as the new Eve in the entire work of redemption, which is why she is called Isha, woman at the beginning, what initiates the whole thing, and she makes up, she is making reparation for what the old Eve did, in a sense, seducing her husband into this fall. She pushes the new Adam, but you'll notice Adam and Eve have a spousal relationship. That's why when I gave you the litany before that sometimes Our Lady's relationship is spousal, sometimes it's maternal, but it is always the new Eve. She stands out completely unique of who she is. And remember, all this begins with a 16-year-old young woman. So that when she does all of this, that our Lord is reminding that she is the new Eve and she is the mother of all the living in the kingdom. And that's why on Calvary, he addresses her again at the end, in, this, in the very pinnacle of this work of redemption, he addresses her as woman. Behold your son. Isha, 
She is the new Eve. She is central. And the choice of our Lord, the Messiah, entering the world for our redemption and the restoration of the human race and the renewal and the creation, a new creation of a human race, that one optic from all eternity is chosen only with the same overlapping of this woman, Maryam of Nazareth. She is essentially part of that same vision to the glory of womanhood, and it's why, artistically speaking, in the Western world, there hasn't been, well, the, the planet entirely, since Christianity is the largest religion, there is no other individual person of whom there has been more art, more statues, more music, more poetry, more books, stories, theological essays about one person other than Mary of Nazareth. A simple woman from Nazareth in a very modest life because she is Isha, she is the woman. She is the new Eve. And we leave you with one last detail to understand why we did this crowning. And you guys did a great job. You even remembered to bring the, the ribbons around the front. It's all right, it's coming up, good. Though we missed you on Palm Sunday. What happened on Hosanna Sunday? We missed you. Oh well. Next year. So what happens here then? We leave you with one last detail, again from the old law. You know Israel and Judea break apart, and the ten tribes in the north, they break away from the two in the south, and you wind up having the schism, and it never is healed. Those are the lost tribes of Israel that all the conspiracies go on about. Where did they go? They didn't go anywhere. They were deported to Assyria, and the Assyrians came to Samaria, and they all intermarried, and so they're just a mishmash. Those are the Samaritan people. All right. But as the stories are told through the generations of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judea, what is fascinating to see, remember Judea, descendant of David. Remember the epistle today. That when you have the stories being told about the kings of Israel, you name who they are and where they come from and all of that. They're usually generals who usurp and take the position. But in Judea, you have the continuation of the lineage of David. And so they continue to tell you the stories, and they're usually not very good kings. They're usually trying to be half pagan. But anyways, the stories are told. But what is fascinating in the books of Kings is that in the telling of the story of the kings of Judah, you always list the names of their mothers. It's a fascinating, the kings of Israel, who cares? But Judea, these are the descendants of the king of David. This is the messianic lineage from which the Christ will come. And in the listing of all of them, you always have the mother being listed. So that's the last detail that I leave you with today. Who is this woman? This is the queen mother of the messianic kingdom who brings us redemption and brings us the hope of resurrection. And all of it goes back to that one moment in Nazareth before the angel Gabriel announcing a son. And she says, let it be done unto me according to your word. That one pivotal moment is what brings the eternal radiance of the eternal son, the hidden son, into time. This woman is the junction between eternity and time, between the mystery of God and our redemption. May she be praised for all the days until the day of judgment. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, one the Father before all the ages, God from God, right from right, true God from true God, begotten God. Tell what my dear Loho, while what I loho, and for it on you. When you observe what I would have, and I'll bite up with good and high glow, or go on the Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you. Out of their love for you and for your holy name, shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Saints Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Charbel. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered, for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering.
continue on page 876, the Anaphora of St. John Chrysostom, 876. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord God and Father, holy and glorious is your name. You deliver those who love you from all that is contrary to your will. May we who have remained in your divine love be made worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with the holy kings. May we always speak words of peace, think of peace, and work for peace. Through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, we raise glory to you, to your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord. reconciling those who are enemies. You are forgiveness to those who sin, and you are comfort to those who are sorrowful. Open the door of your mercy to our petitions, and in the abundance of your grace accept our prayers. Make us children and heirs of your kingdom through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, and through your Holy Spirit, now and forever. bless you, humanity exalts you, and all creation glorifies you. Look upon your children who call out to you. With purity and holiness, may we offer you an acceptable sacrifice, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O God the Father, and the grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and just. Truly it is right and just to thank, adore, glorify, and bless the majesty of the one consubstantial Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a majesty that does not need our glory or become greater with our things. O Lord, those who sing your praises are countless, and they cry out with angelic voices, and with sweet melodies proclaiming.
Glory to you, O God, the Heavenly Father, for you have exalted our weak human nature. In your mercy you sent your Son into the world for our salvation. He dawned from the Holy Virgin like a ray of light from a bright cloud. He took the form of a slave, yet truly he is the Son of your Majesty. He willingly became man to make us divine. He was born from a woman's womb, that we may be born again from a spiritual womb. He became our brother, so that through his grace we may become your children and heirs. He took us from being slaves and made us your children. He promised us a share in the reward that allows us to call you Abba, Father. He cleansed us from our sins with his precious blood that he poured out for us. For he is your only Son. Kyrie eleison, wabiyamu haldaktum hashon ilem abed chayim. In sabe lachmo mido kodishon tu, o barachu kodesh, waksoya bertar mida kadamar. Sabe kulum mehne, Kul <laughs> Kanno alkoso dam sich homen hamro men mayo. Barecho kade, ya bertal mi tao kado mara. Sabes tao mehene kulho. O no teni tao. De mahon dilen dia tiki khadato. Dahlo faikun wahlof sagie. Make a shadow, Matty. Hosoyan, how may one hoy and an alam alamin? Do this in memory of me each time you eat this bread and drink this cup. You remember my death until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May your mercy rest upon us. O Word of God, who can comprehend that you willingly emptied yourself of your divine glory. Who can explain your miraculous birth from a virgin? Who can repay you for your saving passion which you freely endured? Who can praise your plan of salvation for us? We can only ask of you, O lover of all people, that the sacrifice which we have offered be accepted upon your holy altar in heaven, the dwelling place of your hidden divinity in the company of all the angels and saints. Through this sacrifice, may we be worthy of the forgiveness of all our sins. When you come to judge the living and the dead, do not pass judgment upon us, nor deny us, saying, I do not know you. On that glorious and fearful day, do not separate us from you, nor cast us out of your paradise to a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Rather, because of your holy name, by which we have been called, look with mercy upon us. In your compassion you have made us worthy of the gift of your forgiving body and blood. So make us worthy to be one with you in holiness as you are one with your Father. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, have mercy on us, O Mighty Father. Have mercy on us. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we proclaim. 
confess our faith in you and we ask you, have compassion on us, O God, have mercy on us and hear us. How awesome is this moment, O my beloved, for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Agni Mario, Agni Mario, Agni Mario, Agni Temor Rojo Chayu Kadisho, Unachen Alainu Al Korbono Hono. The body of Christ our God be for us a pledge of life to come. A body that grants us the everlasting joys of heaven, a body that renews our souls and bodies, a body that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. And that the mixture in this chalice, the blood of Christ our God, be a blood that gives new life to those who receive it, a blood that guides us to the safe harbors and the dwellings of light. A blood that renews our souls and bodies, a blood that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. O oh Lord, in your great mercy, when this body and blood is mingled with our bodies and souls, grant that it may be for the pardon of faults and forgiveness of sins, and for the everlasting joy and eternal life with all your saints. We offer you, Lord God, this pure and holy offering for your holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, which you have redeemed. Gather her children into unity, love, and faith, and guide them in peace and security. We offer it for the pure bishops of the true faith, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bashar Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Nisrala Peter, our retired Patriarch, Gregory John, our Bishop, the Venerable Priest, the Chaste Deacons, the pure subdeacons and all the orders of the church. Teach them the word of truth so that they may spread it faithfully. Justice and holiness, may they care for the flock that you have entrusted to them. Give them the proper means to accomplish your will and grant them a long life. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord of goodness, your holy church, and have mercy on all her faithful. In your compassion, heal all the wounded and injured among your flock. Punish injustice, strengthen all our brothers and sisters. Bestow the grace of conversion on all. With your indestructible power, strengthen the bishops of the true faith, that they may be upright and courageous in their apostolic office. May they show fidelity as they stand ever before your eternal justice. Unto your honor and glory, may they prove themselves upright, dauntless, and persevering in the task confided to them, to lead all the faithful into the fullness of your redeeming light and glory. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the dejected, for the poor and dejected, for the orphans, widows, for the sick and distressed, and for those tempted by evil spirits. Be the guardian and refuge of their lives. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember the Holy Fathers, prophets, apostles, preachers, evangelists, martyrs, and confessors, especially the holy, glorious, and blessed ever Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Saint John the Baptist, the messenger and forerunner who witnessed the betrothal of your holy church to your son, glorious Saint Stephen the Archdeacon and first martyr, and all who pleased you and professed your name, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all the faithful departed who have gone to you from this altar and from every place throughout the world, grant them rest in your heavenly dwellings with all your saints, and in your mercy forgive our sins and theirs. Grant grace to all who are 
rest of God to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed, with or without full knowledge. O Lord, do not deprive us of your mercy, but keep us in the palm of your hand, lest we fall and go astray, so that we may walk on your paths, follow your ways, and do your will. Forgive us and our departed, and pardon all sins and transgressions, hidden and seen, committed with or without full knowledge. Make us worthy of a faithful Christian death that is pleasing to you, and join us to your righteous ones and to those who have done your will, that in us and in all things your blessed name may be glorified with the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. sent us your only Son, who is the radiance of your eternity. He accomplished his plan of salvation for us, that we may come to you. May we call upon you with the prayer that he taught his holy disciples, the saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Oh yes, O merciful Lord, we ask for your compassion. And by your grace, make us worthy that your glorious name may be made holy in us. That your kingdom come to assist us in our weakness, and that your will dwell within us. Deliver us from all difficult temptations. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake in it and receive the blessing from the Lord. O oh Lord God, you are good and the lover of all people. Look upon those who bow their heads before your majesty and bless them with every spiritual blessing. Do not turn us away when we approach your divine and holy gifts, and let us not be guilty of unworthily receiving the body and blood of your only Son. Rather, make us worthy to share in your holy and life-giving mysteries with purity, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your good and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility, and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. 
one Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord, for He is one in heaven and on earth. To Him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by Your holy blood, and our souls purified by Your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory.
Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink, O lover of all people. Have mercy on us. Lord Jesus, you have made us worthy to share in your holy body and in the cup of salvation. How can we repay you for these your gifts and graces and for your goodness? As you have called us to approach this life-giving banquet, make us worthy, so that your body may be mingled with our bodies and your blood with our souls for the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins, and eternal life. You are blessed and your kingdom is holy. We raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. O God the Father, we bow before you, and we entrust ourselves to your care. We ask you, imploring your mercy, to rest your right hand full of blessings upon us. Assist us, protect us, bless us, and sanctify us by the Holy Cross of your only Son. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. So as we mentioned to you, the second collection today is for the National Basilica. And also you'll find in the back of the church on a table, we've made up a card. What I propose to you, as you know, that Father Chris Paselli's 50th anniversary is coming up to be celebrated on May 19th at Notre Dame. 
Well, so what I propose as a parish is to present him a spiritual bouquet. After 50 years of priesthood, you don't need any more stuff. Well, after 50 years of anything, you don't need any more stuff. So, but to pray, we're going to do three Masses that weekend. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday will be, all three of them will be for his intentions. So what I propose is those who wish to present Father with a spiritual bouquet of prayers, that each person say three rosaries between now and then for his intentions, and you can sign the card in the back, and that way what I'll present to him on that Sunday will be this bouquet of prayers offered for his intentions. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.